Why do we love art? Why do we love music? Why, when we're feeling unloved, do we eat more food? How do we evolve language? Where did the mind come from? Why do we have a mind? There are immense questions out there about the very fundamental nature of human existence. And they all come from thinking about, hmm, how are we different from chimpanzees? Each chimpanzee is as different from every other as we are. They have very, very clear personalities. There are good mothers and bad mothers in chimp society as in human society. The experience of the child during those early one or two years is really significant in shaping their adult behavior. The chimpanzees have forced people to realize that we are not the only beings on the planet with personalities, minds, and feelings. The picture of human evolution was really quite simple. He went from Australopithecus to Homo erectus to archaic people to modern people. And it was simple, uh, but in retrospect it was uh, a simplicity born of ignorance. The last 30 years has seen an explosion of new finds, new species, new genera of fossil hominids. There have been many experiments in human evolution. Most of them ended up in extinction. We're the only one that has it. Over the course of evolution, we get these big brains. And when you get a really big brain, you can start doing some very abstract stuff. And one of the really abstract things that starts happening when you're a smart, sophisticated primate is you can start getting worried about things that are not for real. You're a normal mammal, somebody is intent on eating you, and you turn on the stress response thing. And what that stress response is designed to do is save your life in the next three minutes. But it's not until you get to us that you can do stuff like turn on the exact same stress response, not because you're getting attacked by some rival, but because suddenly you're smart enough to realize you're gonna die someday, or something incredibly stressful happened in the novel you're reading about some imaginary character. It didn't evolve for that. Look at some diseases of humans who don't deal with psychological stress very well. These are some of the leading psychiatric disorders. Marathons are not a fluke, they're actually part of our biology. As humans are phenomenal long distance runners. We're dreadful sprinters, but we're better than any other mammal at running really long distances. Why did humans start running? I believe it's because of hunting. For millions of years, humans ran barefoot. And only in, since the 1970s did people start running wearing running shoes. And it turns out that barefoot runners actually perform better and injure themselves less. It's evolution that matters in terms of understanding how the human body works. Chimpanzees living in groups with their relatives search for individuals in neighboring groups, particularly males, and kill them. There are only two animals on Earth that do this, humans and chimpanzees. What does it mean that it is ourselves and our closest relatives that show these patterns that many of us think as cultural, which is the pattern of war? There's a lot more biology to our behavior than we used to think. Chekhov said, man will be better when you show him what he is like. And I see the point of the sciences of mind and brain informed by evolution as showing us what we're like, showing us the kind of errors that we're prone to in making judgments, showing us the kind of emotions that can cloud our judgment, and therefore empowering us to think around these problems, to develop ways of discounting the parts of our own mind that, that get in the way of greater cooperation, greater wisdom. As we look ahead to the enormous challenges of the future, whether they're to do with climate change or outcoming diseases or the way that people behave in the future, then we need to understand the way that life works at every level. And the way life works is through evolution. There are three crucial sources of information about who we are as a species and how we came to be that way. Studies of primates in the wild, 
studies of hunter-gatherer peoples, studies of human fossils. All of them are delicate, endangered research operations. None of them is being fully funded by the federal government. In this business, there's a lot happening very quickly. Lands becoming unavailable. Dams are being built up that may flood important paleontological areas. Populations of primates are going extinct. Um, it's critical to get as much work done as soon as possible. We don't question whether public money goes to support libraries or uh, concerts, uh, music, uh, literature, uh, art. We, we don't argue about that. Those are all very profound things that, uh, that nourish the human soul. So does science, and especially human evolution. Whenever you turn to the New York Times and you see some kind of a science article, some kind of great discovery from some scientist in some remote part of the world, you can absolutely be assured that that scientist either was funded in that research by the Leakey Foundation or had his career launched by the Leakey Foundation when no one else would fund them, when everybody thought the idea was too risky. And like venture capital, the greatest rewards come from taking the greatest risk. The Leakey Foundation, it's spectacular because they are providing the foundations of how we have to think about every aspect of our biology and our health and our well-being and all the good stuff, and they're one of the only ones doing it. Without Lewis Leakey fighting to get that first money for me to go in 1960, there would be no Jane study of the Gombe chimpanzees. How big an exciting story is it to know where we as a species come from, what we are doing here on this earth, what turned us from an ape into a human. These are things that give meaning to our presence and it's still a developing story.